So my name's Maya Rose Craig. I'm 18 years old and I'm a bird watcher and environmentalist. Um, and I think this conversation to do with mental health and nature is so important because they are so intrinsically linked. And I think that there's been a real lack of conversation historically. Um, so I've been really fortunate growing up. I, like I said, I'm a bird watcher and I've always had that opportunity to go out into nature and de develop that love of birds and the environment and spend time outdoors. Um, which as someone who experienced that, I think it was so important like for my development as a child to have that connection to nature. Um, but I, unlike many kids who do get that opportunity, I sort of stuck with bird watching as I got older partly because I had a sister who was a lot older than me. She was very, very cool. Um, I wanted to do everything that she did and that included bird watching. Um, and so, like I said, that connection to nature has always been a really important factor in my life. Um, but I am also half Bangladeshi. And as I got older and older, I really became very aware that I just never saw anyone that looked like me out in nature, out in the countryside. And as someone who'd had that connection, it had been such an important part of my life. I found that really upsetting that other people weren't getting that opportunity. So I decided to do something about it. Um, and I was 13 years old at the time when I started um, running nature camps for VME or visually minority ethnic um, teenagers, particularly from inner city Bristol. Um, and giving them that opportunity to go out and engage with nature and green spaces quite often for the first time. Um, and this was a slightly more difficult task than I had anticipated. Um, and I really did throw myself into the deep end with this project because what I hadn't realized is that um, something that came so naturally to me and was such an important part of my life was completely alien and completely on the surface level, uninteresting to these kids that had come on the camp. Um, and they came that first evening, it was a weekend long. And I was like, what have I signed myself up to? This is gonna be a disaster. They're not having a good time, this is a mess. Um, but like the next morning when we went bird watching, they were sort of, you know, just moaning about their feet hurting. And I was like, oh, this is a disaster. Um, and then a volunteer came up to them and started chatting to them about peregrine falcons of all things and started comparing it to the speed of Formula One race cars. And suddenly it was like a light bulb moment for these boys where suddenly th this whole world of things that were completely alien to them was suddenly made relevant and it all sort of slotted into place within their own life experiences. Um, and it created a reference point for them basically and creating this understanding and love of something new is the basis for these camps that I run. Um, and we have a lot of conversations with these kids about um, mental and physical health, because like I said, a lot of them have literally never been to the countryside before. Um, and we like to have conversations with them, especially the younger kids, about how it is really important to spend time out in nature, to spend time in green spaces, not necessarily using that terminology, but talking about, say, if school's got you stressed, if you have too much homework, if you go on a walk in the park, if you go and look at the birds and the squirrels, that will make you feel better. And when we've gone back and talked to these kids after the camps, they've said that when they've tried to do that, it's worked. It's something that they've started implementing in their life. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, but I also campaign to, um, to do with climate change. Um, as, like I said, my mum is Bangladeshi and um, that sort of makes the issue of climate change, like not this distant dystopian thing, but something that feels extremely urgent and extremely tangible as an issue. Um, as you know, um, my family's home country is experiencing droughts and floods and storms and crop failure. Um, and you know, it's a country that's already extremely feeling the effects of climate change, um, including my own family in our home village. And I think something that we also need to talk about a lot 
um, in terms of the climate change movement, but within the environmental movement in general, is this issue of the West or the dominant powers um, sort of palming off the pain and the cost of dealing with climate change to people in the global South who haven't necessarily contributed a lot to the issue. And I think that that's an issue generally when it comes to um, environmental movements, engaging people with nature, where, um, you know, there's a lot of historical and systemic factors and it's really easy for people, um, for example, environmental organizations to palm off the blame and be like, no, actually, um, we're doing everything right. It's the people who aren't in power who need to be trying harder. And that's not how um, fighting for equality works, basically. Um, and that that is how it is in terms of um, our mental and physical health as well. And for me, I think something that I found extremely shocking is that I think it's been more than five years now since um, the NHS officially declared that going out into green spaces and nature is good for your mental health, that it was something that they were going to prescribe to make people better. And that there's been no active or systemic um, movement to improve access to green spaces, to encourage people to be going out into green spaces when people have identified that it's so important, um, especially um, when, you know, there have been various reports showing that um, minority ethnic people go out into nature less, they have less of a connection um, for various different reasons, which I will go through in a minute. Um, and especially because um, black people in the UK make up nearly 60% of people who are sectioned despite being 12% of the population, which obviously that comes down to various factors. But when there are really, really clear ways to at least start to deal with the issue, especially that don't cost very much money, I think it's incredibly surprising and disappointing that things aren't being done about it. Um, so in terms of my own work, um, I have, as well as running my camps, I've been doing a lot within the nature sector to try and get them to engage with people from different um, minority ethnic um, communities. And not only to increase men membership, but to increase the diversity in the people coming out into re reserves, coming out into natural spaces. Um, so I wrote to them all and they all wrote back. Um, this is, sorry, this is back in 2015 when I was 13. Um, and they all invited me up to talk to them and I couldn't because I had school. Um, so I brought them all together and organized this conference called Race Equality in Nature, which um, instead of me being the expert, um, I brought a lot of um, race experts from these communities to literally just sit down and tell these organizations, tell the sector what the issue was. Like, and it was literally that simple. It was a day worth of them telling them um, every single thing that they thought was a barrier into minority ethnic people connecting with nature. And the people from these organizations said it was the most eye-opening day they had ever had, that usually they went to a conference and they learned one or two new things and that was what made it worth it. But that nearly every single thing that they learned at this conference, they'd never even thought of before. And that's how disconnected the nature sector is from these communities. Um, and I do think, you know, this is a massively circular issue where because they're struggling so much to engage with these communities, they have no idea how to interact with them, how to talk to them in the first place. Um, which is why I set up my organization, Black to Nature, to promote these changes and to help them um, figure out what they were doing basically, but also to make sure that this wasn't an issue that was going to slip away into the background like before I started campaigning about it. Um, so the work continues. I was doing more campaigning, more nature camps and more conferences. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you guys about some of the, just some of the barriers that we came up with on that conference, um, because it was a really, really broad range, which I think it is a very complex issue. And it's the reason it hasn't been solved already, to be honest. Um, so it was a massive range of things. Um, from um, there being very often a cultural fear of dogs within these communities, them being very afraid of venturing into green spaces because they're worried that there are going to be dogs around. Um, the fact that there are very few of these sort of nature projects working with inner city teenagers, they tend to focus on very 
certain types of people. Um, the fact that lots of these communities don't have, uh, especially the elders in these communities, don't have appropriate clothing for going out into um, the outdoors of Britain. Um, and, you know, the fact that public transport in the UK, especially out into the countryside, out in, into green spaces, is incredibly difficult. It's not only extremely expensive, but it's very infrequent and it's extremely impractical to be getting in and out of the countryside or even to a national park or somewhere like that by public transport. Um, but there are also really large systemic issues as well, like um, just the issues in general of poverty and class and inner city deprivation, but also the fact that a lot of these communities perceive the countryside and nature to an extent as being white and elitist and the fact that they're not entirely wrong. Um, and, um, you know, also just the fact that there is this lack of awareness in the communities of nature's health benefits. And I think that, you know, it's that last point that highlights the underlying issue, really, where there are all of these massive issues going on, but also people have no understanding of why they'd want to be going out into green spaces in the first place. It's not like um, lots of people in these communities have like a wild desire to be going out on hikes um, in the mountains or whatever, because that's something that is so completely separate from their day to day life. Um, and a lot of people, when I talk about this issue, say that it's not necessarily to do with race. It's sort of the fact that in the UK, there's a massive intersection between race and class. But there was actually a study done in 2016 that um, made the distinction between race and class regardless. Um, and it was a Natural England study. And it showed that 77% of children from high socioeconomic groups visit spaces weekly um, green spaces, sorry, weekly, while for VME children, that stat drops to 56%, um, regardless of class. And I think that that showed that there is this massive disparity that's absolutely unaddressed. And I think um, one thing that we've been talking about a lot lately, which has made a massive difference, is I think in the UK, um, we have a very, me included, like as a bird watcher, we have this very certain perception of what engaging with nature is in the first place. Um, and for me, that really is like putting my binoculars on, going down to the local nature reserve, seeing what I can see. Um, and that really doesn't do it for a lot of people, regardless of race. And I think um, really diversifying our perception of what engaging with nature is, what you can the activities that you can do for example while spending time out in nature and that would also have a massive effect on people's desire to go out in nature because people that might not want to do bird watching may be very happy to play like a game of cricket or something in the park and that still counts as being out in nature as being surrounded by green space even if it's slightly more degraded than places we have in the countryside um so I've been doing this work for about five years now, this campaigning for about five years now. Um, and I have to say that it has been really difficult just because, like I said, it's a really difficult um, issue, but also race is a really uncomfortable topic for a lot of these organizations still because they are very white, they are very middle-class, they're very homogenous. Um, and I think it's so important to get past that point, but there's so little desire to create change um, and I think at the end of the day like that's what it comes down to none of these massive broad issues um, can be solved unless we have people from these organizations who essentially have monopoly over green spaces in the UK like I do think we have to clarify that um, and if they have no desire to attract people except their usual traditional audience that they've had for decades, then this isn't going to work. Um, and I think, um, you know, a lot of people like to adopt this nar narrative of saying they don't see colour, they don't see race, um, but that not seeing colour means that you can't see the patterns. And I think going forward, um, globally, but in the UK, we have to start working to create positive change or it's not going to work um so yeah thank you 
Gosh, um, but thank you so much. That was brilliant. I, whilst you were speaking, I was wondering, where have you got your motivation from for all, for all the terrific work you're doing? Where, where's it come from? Thank you. Um, well, like I said, when, like I was very young when I started doing this campaigning, this diversity work, and it, it originally really did just come down to the fact that um, nature had been such an integral part of my own life. And again, I found it incredibly upsetting that um, other like massive chunks of people weren't getting that same opportunity. And I think now, like it's something that the more I look into it, the more I realize what an important issue it is for people's mental and physical health, for the sake of the environmental movement, for, to be honest, diversity for diversity's sake. I think it's something that we have to create change. And I'm a very stubborn person. So I don't think I'm gonna be giving up anytime soon. Well, um, it's good you're not giving up. Now, earlier this morning, I don't know if you heard the sessions, we were, um, Jonathan Porritt was imagining what would be happening when he's 100, Bella Lack when she was 50. And so I'm going to ask you, um, in 50 years time, which I believe um, my, my maths are right, 2062, you'll be 50. What, what, um, what do you feel you you have gone on to do and how do you feel the world has changed has it changed for the better or worse etc um well I do think it will have changed I think that's inevitable um but I don't know whether to let my sort of inner pessimist take over and try and be very positive about it because I do genuinely think um there's always you know, we're always at a crossroads really, and there's always decisions to be made and things to be prioritized or not prioritized, um, which I think shine through very clearly sometimes. Um, so I think that's quite a long time away in terms of the various health and environmental crises that we're dealing with at the moment. So to be honest, I think that we either would have solved ev like everything to an extent, um, and it will be very lovely and we won't hopefully be dealing with issues like climate change anymore um or if we don't do anything about it if we sit and let it happen um i think we could be in a world that highlights inequality in a way that we can't even imagine at the moment because i don't ever think that everyone is going to suffer equally because of these issues i think that it's the people who are the most vulnerable um the people from the global south poor people who are going to be um, the ones who are affected um, by all of these issues that we're dealing with at the moment. Sure. Now, Sarah wants to know, what would be your favourite activity to suggest to someone who doesn't usually go to green space to get them to try it out? I'm working on a project within with the NHS, encouraging people to go outside and because of COVID, instead of directing them to group activities, we're having to use online prompts to try and persuade them to do it themselves. And I need some new inspiration, please. Um, yeah, I think there's loads of different things that you can do in it. Um, in some ways, the internet makes like creates more options than off the internet. Um, so I think with young people, like like it sounds very shallow, but appealing through social media and the things that they're interested in, something I call like nature by stealth, um, where it's sort of you're doing something that the people you're working with enjoy, but it just happens to be spending time out in a green space is incredibly effective because people that, um, like I said, it is very alien to, are very reticent to try new things a lot of the time. Um, but I think also, um, like with a lot of elders in these communities, for example, appealing to sort of their green thumb and talking about like gardening and allotments and that side of things is incredibly appealing. Like um, my Bangladeshi grandma, who she immigrated in the early 60s, I think, she's always been incredibly passionate about her garden and growing vegetables for herself, even when she hasn't needed to. And I think, you know, there's so many different ways to go through but um, something that's always been, because I've, I've been struggling with this too during the pandemic, something that I think is incredibly effective is, you know, appealing to that family unit um, and, you know, not just being like, you need to go off and do this, but suggesting like really enjoyable days out for the family, um, which I think a lot of people that 
even those that have never tried that sort of thing before are incredibly eager to escape, even if it's just for a day and go and do something different. And I think you can see that through um, the number of people that have been trying hiking or birding or any of those sort of green activities in the last six, nine months. And um, Sarah wants to know, what would you say regarding your work and issues with the outdoors and nature and regarding how some women in the Bangladeshi community are expected by their own community to go outside as little as possible and therefore going on a trip into nature might be frowned upon? Hmm. Yeah, I do think it's extremely difficult. And this is actually one of the reasons that my camps that I've been running have been incredibly effective because we've um we have we have children from all sorts of communities but we are like I'm Muslim and my mum is Muslim and we we actually before the camp spend a lot of time going and just talking to family talking to parents telling them why this is something that's so important for their kids to go and do because like I said there's a lack of understanding and a lot of um the older generations when it's never been something that's been on their agenda um, but also we're seen as very trustworthy figures by the community because they know that we're going to um, uphold standards in like a certain way. Like they know the food's going to be halal. They know it's all going to be like their kids are going to be well looked after, for example. And I think that makes all the difference. We've had a really large amount of Muslim women and Muslim girls come over. And it's, there's all, all, all of these communities um, have their own... Um, you know the own, their own things that they're worried about and that's why having these conversations before the camps is so important um and actually um when we we do primary and secondary camps and on the primary ones we have quite a lot of mums um come along with their children with their children and they've actually said that they really want um for us to run a camp just for them like as mums to get away for a weekend um and i think it's incredibly telling that lots of parents that would never dream of letting their kids go out on a school camp for away for a week or whatever, are willing to trust us with their children for a weekend. And I think it really shows that sort of bridging that gap and just commun communicating on people's own terms is so important. Thank you. Now the final question from Kelly. Thank you, Maya Rose. Your talk is really inspiring. So encouraged by your energy and focus humans exploiting and destroying nature on unprecedented scale. The government claims to be saving the country's most threatened species, but the 2019 State of Nature report found 41% of UK species are declining, and one in 10 is threatened with extinction. How can we connect communities with nature in cities and in the countryside and encourage a great understanding of what is being lost and how we can protect at both the local um, and political level. Mm, yeah, um, thank you, Kelly, you're absolutely right. I think the way that this government has dealt with um, nature conservation has been genuinely really upsetting considering the, um, well, the clues in the title, I think that the Conservative Party should be conserving because that's what they're supposed to be doing. But anyway, sorry, that's a separate thing. I think um, it is an incredibly difficult issue. And this comes a little bit back to what I was talking about before in terms of what our idea of engaging with nature is. So for example, during the pandemic, we've seen a massive surge of people buying houseplants and like filling their tiny apartments with um, houseplants to try and give themselves some green surroundings basically. Um, and I think, you know, that's a, an example of people DIYing that connection to nature, which is becoming more and more important. Um, and I think it really comes down to the little things. Like, so for example, the fact that um, in the poorer areas in a lot of cities, um, the parks and green spaces are much more degraded than in the wealthier areas. Um, the fact that, like I was talking before, saying before, public transport is incredibly expensive um, and it's sort of circular. It gets more expensive because no one uses it and no one uses it because it's very expensive. I'm um, getting in and out of the city, I mean. Um, and I think that, sorry, yeah, making all of these like tiny adjustments, like it doesn't have to be massive and systemic necessarily, is going to be so important going forward because it doesn't look like um, there is being an effort to save our biodiversity in the UK. Thank you.